it's your boy Ancient Albatross here again with the Cypher Unlimited crew. We got the usual suspects of Dean or Alpha Dean. We have Anthony or Spigs18. And uh, Anthony, it's been a while since we had a heart to heart. How's it been, man? What's up? Yeah, man. You know, I'm really freaking depressed. You know, I, I had this great idea for a Revenge of the Nerds game, but you know, they never made a tabletop RPG for it. Anthony, that sucks. Wait, no, no, no. Anthony, what are you doing? You call yourself what? a nerd. You call yourself a nerd. You are a excuse, bad excuse for a nerd. Just use the cipher system. Yeah, that's true. What am I thinking? Oh man! On this video, we're gonna talk about adapting settings that are not normally common to the cipher system, and we'll let uh, Dean take us away. Well, uh, as Anthony said, that's what we're gonna do. Each of us have taken uh, an approach to developing our own little settings or something that has. Uh, inspired us in some way and we're all going to talk about each one of us is going to take a turn and we're going to talk about little things that we've done within the cypher system rules that didn't necessarily exist but taking concepts from cypher and building upon them you know basically to highlight the modular nature of cypher system and just how easy it is to bring to life whatever it is you're trying to do because most people i think a lot of people will forget is that don't have to do a one-to-one -one conversion or anything you just adapt it and bring the atmosphere and flavors so we're going to start out um i believe anthony you uh we're gonna i guess talk about i'll go first you know i'm super psyched to have this discussion i think you guys know uh this is my wheelhouse this is what i enjoy to do the most i like taking crazy concepts and adapting it to the cypher system and then once I hooked up with Dean about a year ago, he opened my mind up to a whole different way of doing games, you know, and um, like I used to worry so much about adapting and finding the right rule. And Dean kind of opened up my, you know, he opened up the doors for me to say, hey, you don't really need to do that. And then I think it took my uh, gonzo gaming to a whole new level. You know, I've done all sorts of games, you know, I've done Cowboys versus Aliens. I've done Scooby-Doo. I've done The Godfather, which I'm gonna talk about right now. The game, I guess, is the freshest in my mind. I I ran a game about a month ago called Lucas Sleeps with the Fishes, where I basically took the Zootopia setting and the story from The Godfather and I squished it all together in a ball. So I, I think that's a, I'll be a perfect example of, um converting a setting that has, there's nothing in the Cypher system that's even remotely close to this. You, everyone played animals, everyone played rats or mice. So I guess, um, Dean, you want me to just go over my thought process? Or? Yeah, why not, um, you know, well, for you, yeah, tell us how you shaped it, you know, okay. first of all, and then, you know, me and I will probably ask some questions for you, but. Uh, all right, so I guess I started off, I, I came up with a concept, an idea, Actually, I think it was on the CU. I, I, I have said something, oh, hey, you know, I want to do The Godfather with mice. And a couple of people reacted, you know, positive to the idea. So then I said, okay, maybe I have something here. So I think the first thing I did was, before I even came up with a story, uh, you guys know I'm a lazy GM, so I try to do as least amount of work as possible. So I said, okay, what are the key aspects to, what's the most important thing about this setting? You know, what, what, is, what do I absolutely have to accomplish in my prep work to run this game? So I said, the first thing I, I need to do is um, develop animals, like uh, what abilities each animal would have. So I knew that to make it easier for me, because once again, I'm a lazy GM, I, I said, okay, I'm gonna give them the option to only pick one animal they could play as. So then I, when I first, pitched the idea I used mice so I said okay that mice was going to be my base so then I quickly googled you know I googled types of mice in New York City and it came up to four different types there's two different rat types of mice there's uptown and downtown rats and there's field mice and brown mice those are the only mice that exist in New York City so I said okay this is easy so then I took each type of vermin and I signed the special ability that each character would get for free if they chose that mouse type. So we, 
you know, and basically, you know, that was simple enough. I just took abilities that were already existing in one of the many Monty Cook Games books and gave it as a free ability for each character. Okay. So that's a way of modifying without actually really doing any work, you know. And, and now, just to clarify for everybody, so you kind of get an idea, mm-hmm. what Anthony is saying, because I played in that game and it was great. It was so uh, f- whole so fun. <laughs> absolutely amazing. What he did was he differentiated the, the, the rat and mice types by them being families, mm-hmm. you know, by them, you know, so that whole godfather aspect was there. So just wanted to clarify that, you know, so you kind of got an idea, you know, just like if you think about, you know, in The Godfather or any gangster yeah. movie or whatever you watch, eat different families were known for different things. Yep. So, and, yeah. I, and I basically just use the abilities to make them specialize in a specific aspect. So I believe whoever was a, a let's say, an uptown rat, they, they would specialize in any image intimidation tasks for i don't remember exactly what it was yeah, well, but, and i and, think field mice was like specialized in speed uh, um, uh stealth oh that's what it was <laughs> they, they were specialized in stealth then we we also had uh uh downtown rats got an additional two points of damage on any melee attacks so i basically <clears throat> uh, existing abilities that are already in the book and tacked it on for free for each character. And but Dean it said it earlier, I was gonna say, Dean said it earlier that Cypher System is so modular that giving somebody an extra ability is never game breaking. Never. Never, it's, never ever. You know, even the additional two points of damage wasn't game breaking. Well, it, it, when you really think about it, I mean, let's just think about what you did. Mm. You, you, you made these, these characters unique and you brought the whole idea of the the gangster esque thing, mm-hmm. you know. You know, you had the guys from Uptown. You know, you know. I played the, you know, I I, I played uh, what was his name, Muggsy Stallone, <laughs> yeah. you know, or something like that. You know, and it was like, he was an Uptown rat, right? Yeah, it, it was Rocco. Yeah, you know? and you know, that was Rocco's thing, intimidation. You know, yeah. you think about it. You know, you always got the guy, the enforcer you know tough guy that is always you know <laughs> body in the movie you know the the downtown rats the guy who you know you got the knee breaker you know that's that's what they're known for he's cracking his cracking skulls the field my stealth and it works because it gave you the same sense of the animal but it also gave you that gangster-esque idea so that was beautiful animal. and <laughs> i will also add um <clears throat> that doing adjustments like this where he gave players the chance to pick like what kind of rat or mouse you are it kind of added to the immersion because we had an uptown rat and a downtown rat so we had them talking crap to each other like Yo, yeah. we can't you, know, you a downtown rat i don't, I don't mess with you like you know things like that yeah. and it, again it adds to the immersion it adds to the role playing and it gives players another thing to grasp onto for the character uh, another setting modification that i realized early on that i needed to come up with a quick fix for was since it was a Zootopia type world and the other five families were all different animal types. So I had to adjust damage type according to the animals. So what I basically did was, once again, I didn't you know, invent the wheel. I just took an existing rule that was out there from Vert where I scaled the damage according to the animal type. So mice ran damage directly across the book you know, two, four, six, right? But there was an alligator family, the allegories, right? And their damage scaled the highest. So their damage was four, eight, 12, right? There was a cat family, the Gato family, their damage scaled, oh, no, I'm sorry, four, eight, 12 was the, was the cats. The, the, the alleg- allegory family, they scaled, no, it was four, eight, 10 and four, eight, 12. You know, so I scaled the damage according to the. It's a minor, a minor thing that only came up maybe once or twice in the game, but it was important for me to at least come up with 
a plan before it came up because I was like, hey, you know, you gotta have a mice fighting an alligator. <laughs> it has, you know, there has to be some sort of yeah, that like discrepancy. It's not, yeah, like, yeah, it's uh, not gonna make sense if the alligator hits one of your guys and you only take two points of damage. Yes. You know, yeah. like and the, the other nice thing, the other thing about it, um, when you when you did that, that also put a level of uh, urgency or 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 like I was talking about the immersion, you know. You're a mouse. You're a rat. You don't want to fight an alligator. You just don't. <laughs> yeah. a, a, a great example is you. I don't know if you remember the early scenes when Alex was trying to. She was the getaway driver, and she was trying to escape out the house. And the the um, cat threw his axe. At oh. Her mom. <laughs> and you know, and we basic you know basically would destroy the whole car. Yeah. You know. Oh. And I, I just want to add one funny aside as to why I'm laughing. So as this axe is getting thrown out of car, my character's in the trunk of the car and we're driving away. So if it hits the car, <laughs> odds are it's going to hit me. <laughs> but that's another story for another time. <laughs> but, see, and, and those, but those things, you know, and it worked out because, you know, the fact that, you know, Alex's character was uh, the driver mm -hmm. and, you know, had driving and all of that stuff, you know, all of her foci and everything related to that. That was where the shift came because, again, you know, smaller, faster, you know, being able to dodge and weave out of the way. So you brought all those elements into play. You know, there was that, there was that sense of urgency. There was that sense of, of, of dread. You know, dealing with the cats and the alligators. You know, as opposed to ourselves. You know, but then when you turned it around and we finally got a chance to go at it with the birds, it was kind of like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone we could finally fight on level with, basically. Right, you know. uh, and last but not least, I think the the last setting piece that I had to come up with a rule, which sounds stupid, but did your characters have disposable thumbs? Because we yeah. came up oh, opposable. We, I mean, opposable yeah. thumbs because we came up early in the game saying, "Hey, are we able to hold guns? <laughs> are we able?" So we had to figure that out. Yes early on so then you know because then it we we wanted that zootopia feel you know we wanted your guys to feel small like mice but also sort of humanize you in in some well, sense you got to remember too you need to and you the one other thing that you did and uh you should mention yes was i know exactly you, well, the sorry. the up world and the low world you know oh. the, the upper world the underworld mm. you know and the fact that you know in this world you know cats were like actually in charge they yeah. ran things the dogs were police and it was just the way that you know they actually had the humans as like kind of their pets yeah. nobody <laughs> realized that they were the pets of the cats who were like these major league underworld bosses yeah, controlling everything controlling everything so i mean it was you know it, it was like a mind blow because especially like when we made it to the upper world you know, in a human overworld. overworld, it was the it was the overworld and underworld. Yeah, right. I, I, you know, that was another discussion we had was, hey, for this setting, will humans exist? And then we decided, you know, since it was a group effort, you know, I, I let I let everybody in the group decide whether humans existed or not. And once they quickly gave me the answer, then I, you know, I had to at least backtrack a little and craft the story from that. So, you know, I think the moral from my side is that I didn't craft the story until I figured out all the setting, what had to be accomplished for the setting beforehand. So, like, you know, I, I think a lot of people tend to get overwhelmed when they want to convert a setting to Cypher system. They think it's a lot of work when, honestly, I did everything on one sheet of paper, <laughs> you know, like... Like I, I picked out the key components of what I thought was the most important that, that I absolutely had to have some sort of conversion to Cypher system and everything else I kind of winged it, you know? And, and, and I'm I'll, I'll gonna just, I'll just throw it out there and I say it all the time. That's why I don't like to use the word conversion when it comes to Cypher. It's truly adapting. It is truly just twisting the the twisting the system a little bit or twisting the setting a little bit and plugging it in you know we're gonna you know you're gonna hear it over and over again let's talk about the modular nature and putting things together you know so 
and I think that might be a perfect segue if you're done. If you got anything else for us, Anthony? No, that, that I mean, I think that's pretty much it. I think you, you hit the nail on the head, you know, that it's it's so modular that, you you know, you could just take a deep breath and, and you could pretty much convert anything. Yeah. I or mean, some, adapt. <laughs> I mean, I I think when we get to uh, Al and um, your yours Dean is a little more um, like I didn't actually have to play with foci. I think I didn't touch that, but basically, I any foci was open was you know open for anyone to pick because we ba I basically left all the descriptors of foci as is, and we just imagined it as a smaller version for mice using the same foci. Mice, right, so, right. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I didn't have to fiddle with any of that. And I know your guys did, but me personally, for this specific setting, I didn't have to do any of that stuff. Okay. Now, that's, like I said, perfectly. Then what I did was um, the setting that I adapted. I've always loved pulp heroes. My father, you know, grew up watching and listening to the old radio shows, The Shadow and The Whistler and you know, uh, reading Doc Savage books and stuff like that. So those pulp heroes have always had a special place in my heart. Um, there was a movie that came out some years ago. Al, you probably didn't see it, but it was called Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow. I sure didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to bring that world to life. Um, but there's always an aspect in those older, quote unquote, superhero shows, those old pulp heroes they didn't define their abilities it wasn't like you know you know like watching you know a marvel comics movie and you know the hulk was irritated with gamma radiation mm -hmm. and his powers are derived from gamma energy or you know iron man uses a repulsor ray which is pure concussive force yeah. <laughs> or, you know, the vision shoots a solar beam out of his head no they, they didn't do stuff like that so to kind of represent you know just some of the over-the-top action oriented things they could do I took the idea that was put forth in uh, the CSR, the Cypher System Rulebook. You know, I took the horror rules, but I flipped it and I turned it into the dynamism rules. You know, and, you know, I would activate, you know, during the game, you know, just like horror mode would happen, the dynamic mode would come on. Dynamic mode would happen when the big action sequences and stuff like that. And the concept was, was where if you roll a 20, you expand the dynamism mode level so a 20 would then at the next time a person roll a 19 or a 20 then the next time 18 and what dynamism was was a pool that would be built up over time for the players to use in order to affect you know things in the game whether it was whether they wanted a a re-roll whether they wanted to you know do some sort of you know over the top player intrusion or whatever the case may be this was, you know, the method that I used in order to come up with that. The other thing I did with that was um, I did, I created some new folk I, which, you know, you guys can find in the heroic mixtape on Drive Through RPG. You know, I'm always creating folk I and stuff like that, you know, but that'll probably be another video when we talk about creating folk I and all that stuff. But the core of adapting that pulp feeling was to get that whole idea of you know um that whole 1940s 1950s you know anything's possible anything, yeah, anything's possible thing you know the guy yeah. pulled, you know you, you know we used to like it was funny i did a thing where if you rolled a one when you were shooting your gun that was another little modification. I mean, if you, if you rolled one, that means you had to make an ammo, rec, an ammo check, you know. So ammo checks were always difficulty, um, start out at difficulty two. And as the battle goes on, difficulty for ammo checks go up. So if you rolled, a, you know, if you failed your ammo check, you didn't have any more ammo. You know, real simple, real, real simple rule. Well, we were playing and we had the guy who was the double gun, you know, the 245 wielding mask Avenger type guy. It was great, you know, because he made he made his role, failed his ammo check. <laughs> they, well, it was great because they had the, the dynamic. Gun, right? Oh, yeah. okay. 
they had the dynamism pool. I had a question about, um, is that a group pool that anybody could share or is it, yes, it um, each one has a, each individual? No, no, it was, it, I made it, you know, I, I thought about doing it both ways, but I made it a shared pool for the group because it made more sense because in those sequences, that's when, you know, you always have the guy who makes the last minute save, mm -hmm. you know, and it was one of those situations. It was like the last point in the dynamism pool. He had no more ammo, you know, and he, the group consensus was, yeah, go ahead and use it. You know, and he was like, you know, I had one bullet left in my <laughs> last special round. <laughs> so, and, you know, and it was, it was cool because it kind of invoked that whole idea to narrate those situations too. So it was like, I've got my, I've got this one last bullet. It's the black bullet, you know? <laughs> we didn't know what the black bullet did. You know? <laughs> You know, you know what I think is a genius about that? First off, it's I think it's in the spirit of Cypher Systems design aesthetic. You know, it's uh you know, at the end of the day, I, I know we said this multiple times, but Cypher System is a resource management system at its core. Right. And you just you changed you added something to the game but didn't change the game. You just basically created another pool, another pool of resources that the players could add, build up, and deplete at the same time, right. and made something hella cool, and it gave the effect that you were looking for. You know, right. like, I don't know, that's freaking no, awesome. It, it you know awesome. what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah. I did have a quick question, though, about the pool. Um, yes. did they have to expend points, uh, after like, you know, when you said you got the 20 and then you could do it from 19 to 20, did they have to spend a point to enable the 19 to 20 or was it just automatically 19 to 20? No, it was just, just, it was again, just the reverse okay. of the horror rules. Gotcha. Okay, horror cool. rules. So it's a dynamic, when the dynamic mode activates, you know, if you roll a 20, guess what? Now dynamic mode is 18 to 20 and you can continue. And the thing about it is. If you're the one who activates it, you can automatically use that point if you need it to for something or whatever the case may be, or you can just let the pool build up. And if the pool builds up, then it becomes community property. So that was the that was the caveat in the in the in the idea or the design. So you know a person rolling, you know, especially like a 19 or a 20, nine times out of ten, they're not gonna use that point because they don't need it. Sure. So, you know, you're almost guaranteed to have a couple of points in there. So it, once the pool gets, you know, you know, seven or eight points in there, you know, or f three or four for that matter, you know, especially like, like I said, they had just put pool, the last point, they had just put a point in the pool. There's only one there, but they were on death's door. You know, everybody's resources were low, you know, their, their abilities. And, you know, the guy who had the gun to, make all the difference, had no more bullets, <laughs> you know? So it was like perfect timing that, you know, that had just happened. I actually have one more question about the pool. Yeah. Can you use points? Like, cause you say you turn on dynamism, dynamism, oh, well, I'm bad at pronouncing, dynamic mode or whatever, right? right? And it's like horror, right? It's, uh, during that yeah. time frame, And then when it ends, you just say, we go back to normal rolling, right? Right. Can you use the dynamic? Di um, so I'm just gonna call it dynamic. The dynamic pool <laughs> outside of the dynamic period, or is it only usable within when that's happening? For the most part, unless you can come up with a really, really good reason why it's only used during dynamic mode play. Makes sense. You know, um, just like with horror mode, because you know when you turn off horror mode, everything goes back to normal. normal. Yeah. 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 No craziness is happening. There's no over the top anything going on. It's just Unless it's me running the zombie game, then the whole game is horror mode for me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fun. <laughs> yeah. oh, boy. Were, were there any other mechanics or any other um, aspects to the setting that you felt you needed to make adjustments to? Overall, no, because, you know, I mean, the brilliance of. Uh, power shifts for superheroes, you know, makes makes that aspect so much easier. Um, you know, um, as far as the NPCs and stuff were concerned, no, I, I didn't have to make any other adjustments. I just needed that one little element, you know, to, to kind of represent that over the top because 
like I said, I don't like uh, you never saw Sky Captain and World of Tomorrow. And those of you out there who may not have seen it, take a look at it. It's it's a good, you know, it, it's 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 good for what it is. It, it brings back that nostalgia. But there's a sequence in there where the guy is flying, um, I think it's a P-51 Mustang, which is a airplane, you know, used during World War II. Um, and some of the maneuvers and stuff that he was doing with this thing, totally and utterly impossible. You know? <laughs> but in dynamic mode, Makes sense. you can break those rules. It made perfect sense. I'm, I'm so glad you brought up power shifts because I think power shifts, I think two things when it comes to adapting crazy settings to cypher system that you shouldn't be scared to mess with. One is power shifts. I think power shifts could be added to, like, it doesn't have to be superheroes to no, add to, no, you, you know, when we did Star Wars, we added power shifts, you know. Um, the second thing I think that is very important is race, you don't need race as a descriptor. So, you know, like that throws a lot of people off, you know, like if you want to do a sci-fi setting or a random, like whatever fantasy setting that you like, you want to do Dragonlance. Once again, it's not going to break the game if I just add Dorf to your sentence or if I add Elf to your sentence and give you an ability for that race. Yep. Right. I have um, a I troll have... or whatever it is you want to play. I have... That's what essentially I did with my okay. game. But no, and you talked about that. I mean, I've done that. I, I actually did that when I created um, my Thundercat Silverhawks mm -hmm. allegory. Mm -hmm. You know, I literally just added, you know, descriptors, you know, based on what type of cat you were or what type, or should I say not even descriptor, but ability. Mm -hmm. You know, and that I, I, the, right more I, the more I think about it, I'm not a fan of race as a descriptor. I think it takes away from... Your no, you, you know what race as a descriptor is is not a good thing because my thing is as if you know what we we know you know from all the fantasy we've all read and everything okay elves they're they're agile they're life yeah. they're long lived you know what those are all flavor but they all they all not snooty right you know <laughs> you know you know what i mean like uh like i i yeah i'm not a fan of race as a descriptor i'd rather just give you like, first of all, I don't think there's anything wrong with giving two characters, to, uh, like giving two, two of everything. Basically, yeah. Yeah, it's two of everything. what it boils down to. And yeah. it doesn't, because of Cypher said, it doesn't break anything. Like, nothing gets broken. As long as all the characters get the same benefit of having something extra on top. Even yeah. if they're a human or something who doesn't yeah. have it, like, they just learn whatever skill they want or whatever have you. Yeah, that's um, a good point. If you do yeah. give race as a descriptor, you do a fantasy, then you have to give humans something on top of whatever they have. Well, yep. it, again, you, you, again, if if you look at cypher system though and this is the beautiful one of the most thing one of the things i love the most and i've actually had it happen personally those little things don't break anything because it's the same concept of being able to play a a fifth tier character you know and you can have a first tier character in a group with a bunch of fifth tier characters the only difference honestly is that that fifth tier characters got more toys to choose from. Mm -hmm. His abilities and stuff like that does not change. You know, it doesn't mean that a first tier character can't do anything in a fifth tier adventure. It's going to be a little more difficult, of course, but then the payoff in the long run is that much greater. You know, I mean, when you when when you think about that, you know, because that's no different than when we're playing and you play with a bunch of first tier characters, and I've done it. I've actually had a seven or eighth level thing for them to face off against. Because I knew, guess what? He got an asset on this. He's going to use some effort. You know, somebody might assist him. So right there, there's three levels, you know. So your your eight, your your level eight character is now a level five. That's doable. That's a, yeah. you know. You know, I, I think it's a hard concept to grasp from people that come from a D20 base because they're used to that gradual build you know, like D20 has that, that aesthetic that, you know, you start off as a, like, peasant. I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say peasant, but you start off as somebody that isn't very skilled at anything, and then you become this demigod, <laughs> you know what I mean? And Cypher system and a lot of other systems, 
you basically start off competent. And in right. some cases, you start off better than competent. You start off pretty darn cool. You know what I mean? You Arthur Fonzarelli. I don't know if Al knows that reference, but no, you know, I, I, I know who Arthur Fonzarelli is, okay? <laughs> hey! Yeah, yeah. What's was his real name? Was his name Henry Winkler? Yeah. Well, I even know the actor's name only because he was on King of the Hill. I will be upfront about that. Do you, also, do you, do you, do you, do you never mind? I was going to ask you could you name at least one other movie or TV show he was in, Henry Winkler? Uh, he was on Arrested Development. Oh, good. I was going to say Waterboy, but that was a good one. Oh, he was a Waterboy. Yeah, Waterboy was yeah, a good movie. I've seen Waterboy. That's a funny-ass <laughs> movie. <laughs> but we're getting sidetracked. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, but, but, you know, it has that gradual development. That right. Whereas, get, but... cyber, like I said, if, if, if I did a... If, if we were to just compare it to D&D, &D, mm -hmm. you know, like 5th edition D&D, &D, mm -hmm. um, a Tier 1 Cypher System character is probably the equivalent of a 4th to 6th level character. You know, because you're competent, you have your ability, you, you can get out there, you know, and it makes sense. You're 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 the adventurer, you're the hero of the story, you know, and I think that's one of the biggest things, too. You know, when I when I develop or, or try to uh, set up an adventure or whatever the case may be, whether it's a one shot or a campaign, I want my player characters to be the centerpiece, you know, you're the Aragorn, you're the Captain Kirk. You're the, you know, kal -El, you know, you guys are the centerpiece to my storyline, as opposed to, you know, there's somebody out there, you know, that you're aspiring to be or, you know, this. Yeah. So. And I will, I will say, I was going to say, I will say this, that um, I do agree with you, but I also think that a tier 20, like we'll use 5e because that's what the base we started with, a tier 20 character in Dungeons and Dragons is way more powerful than a tier six cipher system character. Yes. And, and oh yeah, I, I think they do way more stuff. Like put even if let's just take a basic fantasy. If you took a adept tier six and compared it to a wizard tier twenty. You know, I would say this. I would I, because well maybe. I would you know, but I would think their power levels would still be the same. I think a tier mm. six adept may not have as many spells as a wizard mm -hmm. but i think he would he's got more things to to, to work i mean he's got i mean you can add power shifts and screw around with the power shift to to change the dynamic but i i do think i don't know maybe we gotta do a video on that <laughs> somebody, yeah somebody write that up Let, let's let's do it let's pick like five systems and we'll take the max style character in each system. We'll do like Shadow Run. We'll do like um, D and D, and then we'll compare them all to Cipher System from base level, from tier one, like Mid starting out. Yeah, tier we'll one. do Torrid because Dean will be happy. But um, now that we were mentioning this <laughs> this topic before we move on um, about the uh, the level advance uh, advancement mm -hmm. or whatever have you, something I have seen a lot of people talk about is that comparison of you know gradually getting much much stronger in D and D versus basically the even not even kill because you do get stronger in Cipher System, but mm -hmm. it's not as dramatic. Yeah. And that's an expectation from D and D that people look at um, Cipher System and say there's only six levels. Like that yeah. doesn't like there's twenty in D and D. Like what are you guys doing over there in Cipher System? Is that again what you said is like in D and D at level one you're a, you don't want to use the word peasant but you're a peasant you're like unskilled and stuff. Yeah. Whereas in Cipher System at tier one you're pretty well equipped well you're yeah. adequate and in that comparison you might even say like a tier one cypher system character is maybe equivalent to like a level three character or a level five character in D D, and right. that's like that, that that's where that power like difference comes from is that we're not working in the same scale yeah well, and that one to six you. doesn't have a paragon like you're not the paragon character at level six i don't think so well, well no and see i look at it this way and this is why i was kind of like going like, you know, weighing out back and forth when it came to a 20th level character versus a 20th level D&D character versus a six tier character in Cypher system. And the reason why I look at it is because I'm looking at it in the sense that within each tier, there's like four levels, you know, because when you, when you tier up, you have to improve four different aspects within your character. 
So you think about it, you know, and it, it's it's a it's a kind of a hard comparison too when you look at it when you think about D and D, which is system driven and you know um, alphanumeric in its concepts, and cipher system is a little bit more uh, subtle and mm. idea driven. So you know, if I got a a character in cipher system starting out with say a nineteen might versus a character in uh, D and D with a nineteen strength, you know he's getting his plus plus three plus four bonus, you know to hit and damage, you know or whatever it is. Whereas in cipher system, that nineteen has nothing to do with your physical power. It's more like that, your endurance. That's that's, mm. that's your that's your yeah that you know that's your 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 endurance. That's your intestinal fortitude. That's your um, you know, ability to, to keep going and, and, you know, through, you know, willpower, all that kind of stuff all comes into play in that resource management thought process. But, no, but the, the, the reason why I think I, for that, those very same reasons is the reason why I think that the gradual power get the power creep gets what the gap gets wider the higher levels you go. We gotta because, talk about that. But yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, but we let me just that. make this one point. In cipher system, when you when you go up in level, right? When you tear up, say from five to six, you basically getting one ability from you getting points to your pool, you getting another skill, right? And you're getting uh either healing you're increasing your healing and you get in one or two abilities for your type, right? And you're also going to get focus. your foci ability. And now you have at six tier, it's like, you know, you get to choose, but you're still choosing one or two abilities, right? But in a D20 system, you get in abilities for your race, you get in abilities for your class, you get in abilities for your no, like, no, you're not getting any racial abilities in D and D. Yes, they do. Hey, guys, guys, yes, guys, they do. we are getting very oh, sidetracked yeah. here. <laughs> so I will try to bring this back around into yeah. adapting, right? So yeah. if you are, let's say, trying to emulate D and that D and D level leveling mm -hmm. power or whatever, have you into cipher system? Something you can consider as the GM or player, or I guess as a GM because you're the one crafting, you know, mm -hmm. the thing, but. If you want to emulate that, something you could potentially add, and I know Anthony mentioned it before, is power shifts. So each tier, you get two power shifts. And now, boom, that power level is basically the same as D&D. &D. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or I, I mean, I might say one power shift, but still, yeah, the concept is sound. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah. so... Well, We're sorry about the sidetrack, people. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> I know, but see, now we already know we're going to have, like, we're going to have, like, a knockdown drag out discussion about you know, those, those topics. <laughs> but um, I was able to bring us back in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> scholar. And since with that being said, why don't you tell us about your modification? All right. So my thing uh, is a little more in depth than what we've been talking about so far. <laughs> so I did something, if you're on the, the Cypher Unlimited Discord, so you've probably heard me mention it a couple of times. I made adjustments to Cypher System to play something inspired by Darkest Dungeons, which is, if you haven't played it before, it's a very gritty dungeon crawler that has high lethality. Um, it's very intense. There's, a, again, there's a lot of, like, little mechanics here. Oh, what were you going to say? Dungeon crawler. Video game, people. Yes, it's a video yeah. game. Yes, it is yeah. a video game. Al basically adapted a video game to... Cipher, and I have to tell and you, and it was awesome. Yeah, it was. was uh, I, you, you literally felt like you were in a video game on a tabletop, never losing the integrity of Cipher, never <laughs> losing the integrity of an RPG. Back at you, Al. But oh, I, hold on, oh. before Al even starts, I'm gonna just say this because this is hilarious. <laughs> um, we all we all love and know Al, but we all know that Al does minimal work. The reason why I know he was passionate about this. Oh, I did so much work. <laughs> he did so much work. <laughs> like, I was like, yo, who's this out? Did somebody replace Al? Because Al have pages and pages of ideas. Yeah, yeah. Like, again, if you've seen our videos or have, <laughs> have heard me talk on the server, you know how vocal I am about how lazy I am. Like, I am the like definition of, like, I will try to do anything with as little effort or preparation as I can. Like, possible. 
But for this, again, like Anthony said, I was inspired. I was passionate. Like all, <laughs> all that went into it, and I, I did a lot of stuff, right? So yeah. let's, let's kind of dive into that, right? So there was actually quite a lot I had to do to emulate that feeling. So first, let's talk about the game itself, right? So to emulate that dungeon crawl feel, right? So in Darkest Dungeon, when you're exploring a dungeon, right? So you walk, it's just like any other dungeon crawler. And this one is a side scroll or whatever have you. you. You're walking from one place to another. There's random battles, just like most dungeon crawlers. It's a, tur- it's a turn-based game, just if, if you don't know anything about Darkest Dungeon. So you, you'll be walking around a dungeon. Random battle happens, whatever have you. It's turn-based, ETC, whatever, right? But one interesting, really cool thing about Darkest Dungeon, right? Is at, at, like there's in most dungeons, right? There's rooms and there's hallways, right? So it's very simple in Darkest Dungeon. There's always a room and then there's always some exits to leave, right? In Darkest Dungeon, when you're ready to explore the rest of a dungeon, right? When you enter a room, there's a chance of what's a, like if you've played the game, there's a scouting thing that happens, right? And it reveals the hallways and potentially rooms nearby. So that was one thing I really wanted to emulate within Cypher System because I felt like that it really gave that dungeon crawl. Like you wanted to feel like you were crawling through a dungeon because that's the whole point of this game. So what I did was I. Again, it only, you can only do it once and someone can assist them, but there is a scouting role. So once you clear a room, that it could be the first room or whatever room in the middle, whatever have you, as soon as everything's dealt with in the room and you know everything is settled down, the group can decide, hey, we want a scout. You pick a scout, only one person can do it because multiple people get silly. But either way, uh, so one person is designated as a scout role. They roll with difficulty. I forget what I, what I assigned is three or four or whatever mm. have you. Oh, there's actually two. So dif- if you beat a difficulty three, it reveals the hallway. If you re- if you beat a difficulty five, it reveals the next room. So it has that, you know, that feel of being successful. Sometimes you don't get anything. Sometimes you get a little bit. Sometimes you get a lot. And again, oh, want to say something? I saw you raise your hand. I just wanted to interject the, the, the idea you know, for me, how it, it, it translated in my mind, and I think Al has touched upon it when he's talking about doing the scouting roles, but if you think about those video games like that, you're walking and it's dark. The the pathway yeah. and everything is dark on the board. So and you needed the torch to... You need you need, torch or yeah. you need whatever in order to see, you know, you know, unless your character had, you know, infravision or something like that. And he was able to emulate that with that concept, with this scouting role. Because there were times we failed scouting roles within the dungeon. And so we didn't know what was coming. We didn't know, you know, the next thing around the corner. So it afforded him with like cool spots to drop surprise, which were basically just free GMIs, you know. So that also gave a more gritty feel because it wasn't just the one that would give you a GM intrusion. It was, you know, a, not a knowing. <laughs> just not knowing. Exactly not knowing. So it was a failed scouting role. So that gave it a more gritty feel. That gave it a more intense. There was an intensity about being in this darkness, you know. So just wanted to throw that out there, you know. But um, yeah. So that was, I think. I don't honestly remember if that was the first thing I worked on when I started doing Darkest Dungeon, but it's definitely something I felt like that would really capture the essence of playing it. Even if I didn't do anything else, if I didn't adjust any other rules, just having that rule in place made it feel like you were crawling through a dark dungeon. And again, I felt I, Dean just made me again. He made me feel like I did my job well because it yeah. did it did the right thing. You know what I really liked that you did was the bleed. Remember when yeah, I'm going to touch on all that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, again, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll touch on status effects later. I'll, I'm yeah. going to go more on the dungeon aspect, right? Another thing in Darkest Dungeon is there's a torch meter. As you're progressing through the dungeon, your torch gets weaker and weaker. Or you can potentially snuff it out yourself. And the reason for that is, or you can, you know, you can add to the torch and make it brighter. You know, mm. I, I added an item into the game that was a torch that increased the level by one or whatever. So in Darkest Dungeon, there's, I think, five or six levels of darkness. There's zero and then one through five. So I think it's six. So I emulated that in Darkest Dungeon, in, in, in the uh, Cypher system, by, uh, you know, either the players could snuff it out, light it up, whatever have you. But to get it, like, while they're crawling through the dungeon, you know, to get it like that real life feeling of as your time is passing, things are getting darker, right? So most of the time, again, I haven't done too much dungeon crawling in Cypher system, right? But there's no real turn order or anything to, like, keep track of time, right? 
So what I did to keep track of time in the dungeon, right? I ran, like, you can do this during dungeon creation. You can either pick yourself or use dice. I did a little bit of both. But essentially, I assigned lengths to the hallway. Them being one, two, or three. And the what the length means is that's how many dice rolls you have to roll to get to the end. Um, like, excuse me, to get to, um, you know, the end of the hallway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the next room of the dungeon. And what that did was... Um, oh, this, um, there's so many different facets, but the other facet that's in here is the insanity or the stress. Stress is a huge, huge factor in um, dar Darkest Dungeons. And that's, again, another thing I had to add to this. So there was a, like a stress level, at, you know, over the course of doing all this stuff, stress builds up. And for dungeon crawling, as you're progressing through the one, two, or three rolls, if you fail a roll, you get stressed because it's dark and you're... It's like a four to two, a constitution roll, whatever mm. have you, just to see if you can keep a sound mind during all this. And to circle back to that darkness thing, for every, I think I set it up for every four rolls, the torch goes down a level. So the more they're exploring the dungeon, the darker it's getting, the harder it is for them to do things. And the torch levels all come with different buffs and debuffs. And again, it's I, I did a lot of work on it. I'm not going to go into full detail about what each level does. But there's certain, like, when it's bright up, like, you have some bonuses to things. The monsters aren't as strong. But when you get down in darkness, the monsters become stronger. And But to, you know, to give that, um what is it, incentive to want to fight in the dark, fight, you have a better chance of finding good things in the dark. And you also, uh, I think I increased... I, I forgot. I, I'm not gonna. But here, the the first time we played, we we went the fighting in the dark route. Remember when the, you ran to me and Kenny? Yes, yes. And we got some really badass stuff that helped us at the end of the game. Yes, yes. So putting yourself was, at that risk is rewarded because you earn stronger items to progress through. The, but again, it can be risky because the yeah. monsters are stronger. What what I really liked about that game is that I think was three of us playing and we were all constantly getting dropped i think ev every one of us dropped at least twice you know yeah it, it gets intense I'm gonna, I'm, yeah I'm interject here as well um i was talking about a lot of different things mechanics in, in the game but just so you understand they're all basic it's b uh, the basic cipher mechanic. Yes, you're always still rolling a d20. There's always difficulty levels announced. It's all the same base it's, it's rules the from same cipher mechanic. system. It's just again, I'm applying them to different things. Well, that's what we were talking about. If it's modular, yes. So what 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 I like to say about what Al did was that he made he made cipher system a little bit more crunchy. Yeah. Essentially, added some crunch to it to he give that dungeon crawl feel, it, you know. And it it was crazy because it still was just as simple. Yes, it was just as immersive. You know, the the narrative was still there. You know, I mean, it was a great story. You know, you're actually inspired. Like, I think when I played, I think my character. Um, I think you were Hellion. I, I forget. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I was. I sac remember I sacrificed myself at the end, you know, for the better minute of party. And, you know, and, you know, he, Al did a cool little epilogue and it was like, you know, and his name will be written on the wall of the tavern and his name will be spoken in the annals of our history. Da, 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 da. But it was just one of those things. It was great. It, 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 it inspired you to tell your own story of why you were in the dungeon. It, it, you know, I, I played it twice. What was the guy? I remember that I played the guy that whipped himself. Oh, the flat. I mean, according to Darkest Dungeon, that's the flagellant. Um, yeah. I, all right. So now that we're talking about characters, I'm gonna move away from the mechanics bit. I think I already touched on the major mechanics that I adjusted to get that dungeon crawl feel, which was the stress, the torch, and the dungeon crawling, and which again that was all crafted together to give that feel, like gritty feel of crawling through a dark place. And then on top of that, I wanted to add, again, that flavor of the you know the characters from Dark Dungeon. Because if you've played that game, a big thing about that game is forming the right party. And they have really interesting characters and character designs. And, you know, all the characters did something different. So what I did for that is I basically crafted a focus. I didn't, again, I haven't done that much work where they're fully fleshed out, just tier one. But each... Each character class from Darkest Dungeon got a focus. So you could they still all be felt different. Yeah, too. and you could be an adept and still be like 
you know, the flagellant, or you could be a warrior flagellant, or whatever have you. You still had the flagellant aspect going on. So um, what I did for that was, in like I think I gave a like a skill for um, tier one, and on top of that, each class got like I, I don't know how to what's a good way to describe it, but I wanted to give them an extra ability that, like instead of being like just a free ability they could do for rep for um for free or whatever have you um i wanted it to be a little more taxing on them so i added what's called an effort attack it's just a, like an alternate attack they can do but they have to use effort to do it so at tier one you're using effort for this you don't have the effort for you know to hit harder with it or to make it easier to hit you're just using the effort to just do it you know what i mean so and i i craft what happened but those abilities were cool. Yeah, yeah. So I crafted um, each ability per class. I didn't do every single character from the game. But for example, um, Anthony mentioned the flagellant, right? So his thing was he had like a, a cat of nine tails whip. Like that's it. He flails Flame. himself. and he fl No, his thing was multiple things. Like it was, yeah. I think that's specifically. Either way. So <laughs> with the effort attack, like this is something that's not like a warrior or whatever. Have you didn't have this or, you know, I guess it would just be from the full from the who flagellates is what I called it, you know, whips mm. himself. But either way, when you use effort on that, you can do Reign of Sorrow, which I can think is just a direct work from the game. But it's just an AoE attack that adds a status effect of bleed if it hits. So this is, again, what you were mentioning before with status effects. I also added statuses to, to you know, the Cypher system, which they're kind of in it already, but mm. I went more of the route of what's exactly in Darkest Dungeon. So there's bleed, and then there's a crippling, I forget what I called it, like the poison. It, like, it, it makes it harder for speed. We're, getting, we're going with Cypher system. Mm -hmm. And then anytime you took stress, which is kind of like a debuff, you lost intellect too. So I try to get it you know, aligned with Cypher system where it's still paying attention to each of the stats. And again, I, I think it went pretty well. Like each character sometimes can apply, like the flagellant can do bleed or the, um, the plague doctor can throw like a poison bomb or something with their effort. And again, it made every character feel very unique because, you know, the focus is what really makes your character feel unique, which is why I felt the need to craft that focus. Or, you know, at least tier one of the focus because I'm not mm. that crazy. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that's basically, like, all the, did, I, did I miss anything that I'm missing for, well, like, I you, feel like... You, 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 I just don't want everybody to get kind of confused either. And it wasn't so much that that was the focus of your character. Remember, the characters still had their other foci. But did they, I have a regular foci? I no, 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 it was, nah. the focus yeah, was yeah, the tie, yeah. like, I, I'm yeah, I positive so. on that. The only, like, you were still, you still had a type, you still had warrior, That's adept, or whatever right. have you, right, right. but the, again, the focus is what really made you that flagellant, or made you that plague doctor, right. or made you that I, I have a question. Uh-huh. Uh, when you were designing this, like, let's say before you did anything, what, what do you, uh, you wanted to get the feel of, you know, Darkest Dungeon, what, what do you felt was the most important thing that you had to adapt stress stress is a huge huge deal in darkest dungeon uh if you ever played that game it's stressful like not like now i'm talking about the mechanics the mechanic is called stress it's literally stressful to play that game like the odds are against you even when you first start the game is like this game is like a challenge like don't feel bad <laughs> it's like it's meant to make the best of a bad situation like it's intended to be very difficult so one of the things that made it difficult was managing that stress because again you're in going through crazy stuff in a dark dungeon of course is going to take a toll on your mind so what right. i did in darkest dungeon it just i think it goes to 100 and then 200 for your stress and there's two, two things that happen at both points so what i did is like 100 just seems like a big number so i just made it 10. so it's 10 and 20. so when you get to 10 and again it's at the gm's discretion what might cause a character to be stressed whether it be seeing a, another character get critted or falling into a trap or whatever have you um your know, GM's discretion. So once the stress gets to 10, in Darkest Dungeon, there's something called, you test your resolve. So I add a resolve check. When you hit 10, you have to do, I think it's a difficulty five or six resolve test. I forget what I, it's supposed to be hard. So if you fail, you remained very stressed and you get some very really negative like like mm -hmm. um debuff that stays with you forever until you get rid of it via whatever methods in town or whatever have you. And then, you know, if you passed it, you got a actually a very positive buff, like you were courageous or, you know, whatever, have stalwart or whatever have you. And then your stress got halved because, you you know, you, you got that positive thing going. Now you're less like, yeah, let's go. So I think I emulated that really well with that getting to 10 and then doing the resolve roll. 
And then on top of that, later on in Darkest Dungeon, this wasn't always in the game. They added heart attacks. So if your character gets to 100 or in, in Cypher yeah. System 10 stress and you fail the roll, your stress is just going to keep going up past that max. So once you hit 20 or 200 in the video game, you have to pass a heart attack roll. <laughs> and if, if you're so stressed that you get to this heart attack roll and you fail, you die. That's it. Yeah. You're just dead. It doesn't matter yeah. what your pools are at. It doesn't matter who's next to you or can help you. <laughs> if you fail that roll, you're dead. You're just dead. You die. Period. Yeah. <laughs> the thing about it is, though, that's kind of perfect. You know, because like I said, it was gritty. Um, it, it was... It did add that element. You know, because when... You know, we started losing, you know, when we had a couple of people get stressed and, you know, stress was going up. You started to go, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? <laughs> you know, so it was funny, you know. And I will say this as well. Anthony and Kenny, you guys are courageous because I would never play Darkest Dungeon with two people. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was it just you two? No, it was... We played three people. It was me, Kenny, it was, and it was at your house, Danny. right? Yo, yeah, yeah, Danny, Danny, Danny. That's who it was. Yeah, okay, so yeah. I w- I probably wouldn't even play with three. Because, <laughs> Yo, know, we I'm, we kept on dropping. It was funny. It was funny. I must have dropped like four times. No, this is what I'm saying. I'm just thinking about playing with the f- with the five people I played with, yeah. and we were all like at the very edge. We would just by the skin of our teeth, make it out of the room. <laughs> and there's actually one more thing in this vein. Like, now you're saying, like, what did I feel like was, in essence, like, something I had to capture? The stress was one, obviously. And then the dungeon crawling, again, obviously, you wanted to have that feel. Another thing I added, which I haven't touched on yet, and I'm still actually working out how I want it to work, is enemies can crit you in Darkest Dungeon. Like, and getting critted is a big deal, because... Again, you take tons of damage, you get stressed, all that stuff. So I wanted to add a crit element. Again, I'm still on the fence of how I'm going to implement it. I think when, um, in the first iterations of my rules for this, I had it so that when the darkness was below a certain level, then the creatures have a chance to crit. I've since then changed it so that creatures can always crit. Because again, that should just be happening all the time. Mm. And again, I forget how it was initially but at this point right now i have it set so if you get hit by a monster you have to roll another d20 and then that's the crit roll at one point i had it that if you roll a 20 you got critted but that was stupid because rolling high should not be punished doesn't make sense so i switched it (laughs) all right what were you saying i I was thinking that like to go in line with what we're saying about adapting yeah we roll one and you get critted but there was those oh no, I was gonna say that just like the horror rules, you could have like a scale, like one to five. Yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly what I was, I was leading up to. So I, yeah. I switched it up, and at this point, you know, now the crit roll is mm. you roll a d20, and if you roll a one, you get critted. Mm. And what I'm adding with the darkness levels is, um, as it gets darker, there's that level of it's gonna they're gonna crit you more often. So when yeah. you roll, like, let's say you're at torch level zero when you roll your crit roll now you have to take away four from it and that yeah. like you roll a one, one you're five. critted like you yeah. It, one it, to five yeah yeah exactly yeah. now it's that yeah. one to five you're getting crit and it's yeah. just my way of adapting it to that it's just and instead again, of it being randomly like when you roll the one it goes up it was just it's yeah. associated with the torch level and and that is awesome and that's just another aspect people catch on to this You know, we were having a discussion on the Cypher System, uh, Cypher Unlimited uh, Discord channel earlier, and people were talking about, well, what setting do you think would be most difficult to adapt, you know, to Cypher or convert to Cypher? And I actually, none. None, yeah. (laughs) Because... Me, I mean, I mean. Granted, I will say this though: some, some there's a little more work than others. Yes. No, 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 no. But that's my point. If you're willing to put the work in. You can put anything because Al just showed a prime example of what I was talking about, about getting the atmosphere right. And guess what? He used the system to get the atmosphere right, but it's not an entirely new mechanic. It's not another, you know, I mean, it's, it, you know, the, it's boggling to me, mind boggling for the most part, you know, that people don't get that. You know? Heck, Eric Frankhouse redid a whole mecha. He took the whole mecha genre, the whole, you know, the 
the and, whole Robotech style genre and, and convert it to Cypher System. And I think really Yeah, and again, what we're saying here is he didn't he didn't make up a ton of different rules. He just basically took what was there, looked at it in a slightly different way, and that's what added the like the atmosphere or whatever that he was looking for. Right. That. And that that's the whole point. I think I think we as as GMs you know, and affectionados for a cipher system and people who are going to be introducing people to that world. We should remember that and try to always translate that concept that the mechanics are simple. No matter what we're doing, the mechanics 99% are the same. Um, and we're just trying to build, build that atmosphere, you know, and I think, you know, I'm in great company because, you know, Anthony is, I will give him, you know, like he gave me propers earlier. I got to get, Anthony is the king of comedy. <laughs> it's true. You know, he can, I mean, he just ridiculous, crazy hilarity always ensues, but he knows how to capture that atmosphere and bring that, bring that out in you as a player. Al, Al talks about being lazy. <laughs> you know, uh, and Al might be lazy. But when it comes to Al's game... He's lazy! It's facts. But no, but, but, no, but I'm, but I'm going to have to say, but I'm going to tell you. But when it comes to his gaming, as lazy as he might be, he's thorough. You know what? Uh, never... I will say for this thing I talked about, yes, but I don't know so much about other things. Well, <laughs> Maybe you just got mad improvisational skills. Mm -hmm. But I've never played in an adventure or game that you've run that has failed to entertain. Oh, yeah, I mean, I guess it, 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 it's, uh, we've talked about this many times in many videos, but we're all improv gems. Like, when mm -hmm. you say thorough, like, again, my work for my inspiration, like, Darkest Dungeon-inspired stuff, that was thorough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for the most part, it's like what Anthony and I always say. is like we write, like, two sentences and we run off, like, whatever the players are doing and that's it. Like, it's all... I, don't, I am not thorough when it comes to planning, <laughs> like, uh, like, an actual session. <laughs> I but mean, um, only, you know, it always works out well. That's mm -hmm. all I'm saying. Uh, and I appreciate the um, the compliment. But what I was gonna say, just to bring us back, you know, to topic at hand, is what you were saying is an essence of what you should be doing when you're trying to adapt cipher system to anything. Is you're trying to capture the atmosphere. You're trying to capture like what it feels to be in that character's shoes. And you're not trying to reinvent the wheel. If you're adding excess rules like ammo or like, I mean, maybe ammo might be part of what you're trying to do. And that's fine. But you need to really think, is the ammo, keeping track of ammo, is that really immersing? Is that adding to what the setting brings? So for me in Darkest Dungeon, I needed to have that stress. Like it's extra things to keep mind of, but it it's necessary for that immersion. Um. Like for and another thing in Darkest Dungeon is um there's a party order, right? You have to keep track of who's in what order to do certain things. I felt like that was unnecessary for the immersion, so I didn't do anything for it. it as you know in Cypher System, you don't really have to pay too much attention about where you are. I mean you kinda do, but like in Darkest Dungeon you couldn't do certain things if you're like in the back of the line or whatever. I didn't want to be restrictive in that way. So I just got rid of it. So and again, you you still feel like you're immersed and you still feel like you're crawling through a dungeon. I didn't want to add that extra bookkeeping to be more restrictive to make you feel like, why am I doing this? You know what I mean? Well, and again, I mean, again uh, if you're talking about it in that respect, it's a video game. Video games have certain limitations. Yes. You know when the video game was created, depending on what the, what the you know what the graphics capability, all of those things make a difference when it comes to a video game. We're talking about tabletop RPGs and what people, and I think that's the biggest thing that I want to you know get out there to the world. I want. I want to. It's not about. I mean, I'm just about done talking. Yeah. I, I I don't want to limit anyone. I just. I, I, I want you to be able to play. I just want to say this because I think you guys both sparked something when when Dean brought up the conversation and what you just said. I was like, how I want to like fuse what my statement is. But a lot of people, there's nothing wrong with if you want to take a setting from another game, right, and, and convert it to Cypher System. I think Cypher System, a lot of the universal systems, Cypher System, GURPS or whatever, they designed to do this, you know, 
to to do exactly that. And I think it it's not only cipher system. We tend to play cipher system, so we're gonna you know preach cipher system on top of the mountaintop. But I think there's a lot of systems, fate that are capable of taking okay. any setting. But I will say this: if you want the essence of the game, fine, you could convert it to another system. But if you're looking for the same mechanical satisfaction that you get from a setting from another system, play that game in that system. <laughs> Regardless of what, you know, like if you want, you know, if you want Dragonlance and What's you Dragon? want and you want the 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 character progression of Dragonlance, that feel there's nothing wrong with playing it in 4E, 3.5. There's nothing wrong with that. Like, everything doesn't have to be converted for conversion's sake. Right. Absolutely. You know, you know like, a lot of times I hear, oh, hey, I, you know, I want to play this, but, you know, I want to convert it. If, unless you're willing to accept the fact that you're never going to have an exact conversion of that feeling you got when you were playing Torg using the Torg rules, right? Dean is the Torg master, but <laughs> I've never played Torg, but I can tell you with a hundred percent positive that Dean cannot convert the entire game of Torg into Cypher System. Not at all. He's, he's, go he, he's gonna give you the essence of what it is, what the setting is, and he's gonna do a hell of a job at doing that. But he's not gonna give you the same exact feeling you get when you play that original game. Look. So there's, there's nothing wrong. If you want that feeling, then play it in the system that it was designed for. A lot of settings were designed with a specific system in mind. Right. Um, so, and, oh, go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was, just, I was go gonna ahead. just piggyback off that and saying like, you, of course we're talking about cypher system here because what we love mm -hmm. and I'm assuming what Anthony was saying was converting like let's say D&D &D 5 to cypher system or yeah. what any other Torg to cypher system and again there's nothing wrong with playing Torg there's nothing wrong with playing 5e whatever but if you do find yourself enjoying certain things from cypher system why don't you just take that thing put it in a Torg take that thing put it in 5e like it doesn't just because you like let's say the stat pools or like how exp works or whatever have you you can just take that little bit and move it on over there's no sure. need to do it the whole system into like cypher because you like a couple of things you know what i mean yeah. well, i was gonna say that it's funny that you even brought that up al because on my uh sovereign sentinels of geekdom facebook group someone asked that particular question about rolling ones and is it always have to be a fumble or a critical failure and i actually explained to them how to add in gmis right it, you know i gave them a, a concept to add gmis into D D 5e yeah which is super I, simple I, and i'm pretty sure the numenera conversion for 5e is going to have that <laughs> most same... definitely it should anyway <laughs> i'll be i'll be sorely disappointed i'm curious to see when they do that conversion, because I'm pretty sure that it's not going to feel the same. It's not going to feel like you're going to have the Numenera 5e and the Numenera Numenera Discovery of Destiny. And I think they're going to be e extremely similar, but there's going to be some differences that you're going to notice. Well, of course, we, we got to think about it. If you look at Cypher System and you look at Numenera, Destiny, you know, and Discovery, um, that Numenera itself was built on a concept of discovery. When you move in and Destiny is built on a the concept of of community building, world building. You're talking about moving this world into D and D. D and D is not about the discovery. It is not about the community building. D and D is about the exploration and the gathering of things. You know, or, or that's typical D and D. It's about the adventure. So my thought process is that, yeah, Monty and MCG is going to bring the conceptualization, but when you sit down at the D&D table, you're going on an adventure. Mm. You're, you're, you're not looking to discover, you know, the, the, you know the, the history of the world, you know, you're adventurers, you know, and even, even the, what was the tagline, you know, bringing 
you know, uh, science fantasy to fantasy. So that's just my two cents on that. And as far as um, what I was saying real quick to give you guys, anybody who was interested in how I said you could bring uh, GMIs into D&D was basically very simple. Um, of course, rolling a one free GMI, Dungeon Master does what he does as opposed to having you fumble or something adds an interesting complication, drives the story forward. If you roll a 20, um, you can earn an advantage, you know, you know, or if I, or if the game offers you one, that's what he would do. He would offer you a free advantage roll. So your next action or at your discretion, you get to roll 2d20 and take the better of the two rolls. So you always get a little, you get something for allowing the game master to intrude and push the story. And um, that's one of the cool things about Cypher System is that these things they're not the mechanics are so they're not intricate they're very simple and so much so that you can easily like let's say for the intrusions just in any system like if you roll a one there's a there's a chance for gmi you roll the player rolls a 20 there's a chance for a major effect and it doesn't like it, if you again take that to 5e it doesn't break 5e no, it just adds it, another layer and even if even if you the do the same the thing with like exp like you don't get exp in now in D D, like we said, let's take cipher exp. Now murder hoboism is out the window because yeah. now they're not killing people for exp. Now they're trying to you know learn things, do cool things for exp. And again, I know that's kind of like not D D, but it doesn't break five e doing that. They're still right. earning exp in various ways and still leveling up and all that. And again, and it works the other way around too. If you want to add some murder hoboism into <laughs> cipher system. Start giving EXP for kills. Exactly. Yeah. And it doesn't break anything. <laughs> yeah. See, and it, you know, just to make it fun, you know, you murder hoboism as we as we're talking about. <laughs> you, know, you offer that. Uh, you offer that EXP for, like, oh, battle royale game. Huh? Hunger Games battle royale. That's what I'm saying. You can XP do for kills, murder but hoboism. XP, but you get XP. You only get. You do get XP for normal kills, but you only get good like. You might get two points of XP for a magnificent kill. So that natural 20, describe the kill. <laughs> you know, do it that or, way. Or, or you could get a GM intrusion, a free GM, a free player intrusion you could utilize later in the following scene. Exactly. Like, and see, like, <laughs> this is something we literally just came up with right now, like, just from <laughs> talking about it. And that's the beauty of Cypherism. It's so simple to do these things. And it's, I mean, I think this is a good way to close it out. We've been talking for a long time now. But what it really boils down to is as long as you're capturing the essence of the setting, that's really what Cypher System or, you know, moving the mechanics of Cypher System around or whatever have you boiled down to. You want the players to feel immersed in what they're doing in the setting. Right. You don't want to have them be thinking about the mechanics as they're playing. You want them to be thinking about their character's actions, not like, oh, will I have an advantage if I, will, if I like, attack from the shadows? And like, like yeah. no, you want to worry about, like, other things, like your character's immersion, not, like, again, these, like, the other things. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So, oh boy, Anthony, any final thoughts? Yeah, first off, I want to say, um, if any any of our viewers, if you guys converted any awesome settings that you want to share with us, please do put it in the comments below. We want to hear all the cool settings that your guys adopted, and um, you know, and if you have any want any help with any settings that you know that you might want to come up with, and um, we could possibly help with, please put it in the comments below too, because you know. I'm, I'm pretty sure we could uh, definitely figure out something. So give us your, you know, gonzo settings that you want us to try to convert and let us take a crack at it. And please tell us your cool stories. We want to hear about all the cool games you guys are playing. Most definitely. And, um, and Al? Uh, no, you, you, okay, good. Give us your last look. I lost my train of thought. You can go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to say in conclusion, first and second, what Anthony said, absolutely please feel free to reach out. We are more than happy and enthusiastic to work with you, give you any advice we might have. Um, so that's- I'll take any advice you got. <laughs> that too. And the other thing is, you know, and you know, if I were to sum it all up, I'm gonna say it like this, Cypher system 
is simplistic, but it's so simplistic that it's elegant. It is one of the most elegant systems I've ever played. It is inspiring. It always has me working on another idea, um, whether it's a one shot, whether it's something for campaigns, whether I'm working on, you know, a supplement to put out, whatever the case may be. And you know what? You know, I enjoy all the feedback. I enjoy talking to you. I enjoy being able to put out what I know. And hey, you know, like, let us know. You got some more ideas for us, you know, hit us up. And uh, always join us on Discord too. Yeah, I mean, on the usual um, closing out stuff, you know, be sure to like, like, share, subscribe. Um, let us know what your favorite part of this video was. Um, if you have any ideas for us to talk about things in the future, drop them down below. Because as you see, we, we, we love talking about things like this. We, you know. Oh, and the, I don't know what that shaking thing. I'm assuming the bell. Yeah, I was, bell. I was just going to say that. <laughs> then be sure to click the <laughs> notification bell to you know get those um, notifications of when we upload videos. And um, yeah, any other last thing before I close this out? You know, thank you guys so much for watching, everybody. Um, you know, we love doing these videos. And, you know, without you guys, we wouldn't be here. So, um, you know, from us at the CU, we will see you later.